In just a thousand days in office, John F. Kennedy charmed the world and changed politics forever. Using photography and television, the Kennedys captured the hearts of millions. Never before seen photographs from a lost archive reveal the making of the Kennedy mystique. Over 40 years ago, an extraordinary American family moved into one of the most famous homes in the world and changed our view of the presidency forever. With glamorous Hollywood good looks and two camera-friendly children, the Kennedys helped usher in a youth culture that affected every aspect of American life. From behind closed doors in the White House to intimate family vacations, Photography and television took the American public behind the scenes of its most regal couple. Photography went from a medium that documented politicians to a medium that helped sell their images. For a country fearful of communism and on a verge of a race revolution, the eye-pleasing Kennedys comforted Americans while exciting and inspiring people in Europe and beyond. They really conducted a coup d'etat in politics. They revolutionized it, no question. They shoved aside the old guard, Lyndon Johnson, Adlai Stevenson, Sam Rayburn, all of these people. They shoved them aside. And imagery, of course, was a great part of it. And as television was gaining strength, why well, he did more on that. You cast your vote for Kennedy and the change that's overdue. So it's up to you, it's up to you. He had a feeling about time and life and magazines and all of that. In 59, the beginning of the presidential campaign, they, they had an increasing re realization of how uh, good television was for them and how good they were on television. The Kennedy's political revolution would be televised for the first time. Many say it was a matter of being in the right place at the right time, but it was more than that. Pleasure to have you here, and I want you to meet my daughter Caroline and uh, my wife uh, Jackie. He was the first president born in the 20th century. He was in his 40s. If asked how old he was, I can remember him saying 43 and a half, and only children do that. Kennedy's age and young family would send a message to the world that the torch had been passed to a new generation. I think there was a sense of uh, excitement. They were glamorous. They appealed to young people. Uh, the candidate appealed to women. Hadn't always been true. And uh, I think there was a sense of promise that uh, it was almost palpable, it seemed to me. Beginning with the Kennedy inauguration, Washington and Hollywood merged for the first time. Stars like Frank Sinatra, a personal friend of JFK's, enhanced the Kennedys' glamorous image. Who could resist being smitten by a president who looked and sounded like a celebrity and hobnobbed with them as well? Yet beyond the razzle and dazzle was a very powerful, awe-inspiring call for America to come to action. Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans. There was idealism in the there was the sense that here was a young, vital, attractive president who was speaking to our highest ideals. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country.
there was just that wonderful feeling of effervescence and youth and and that there was a better way to do things in the world and you you got that excitement and then he was let's be honest about it very handsome photogenic he and jackie the whole family wherever you pointed a camera it was wonderful you've got you've got a good uh, you've got a good image and transmitting the powerful image of the youthful, dynamic JFK out to the American public was the fast-growing medium dominating American homes, the television. I call upon Chairman Khrushchev to haul and eliminate this clandestine, reckless, and provocative threat to world peace and to stable relations between our two nations. The Kennedys were perfectly cast for the mass medium. Television really helped make them. They were the first family who really understood the power of the image. He was the first one, of course, to hold televised press conferences. Lots of people told him he was making a mistake, that he could stumble, he could uh, injure the country's national security, he could jeopardize the standing of his administration, and he discounted it because he knew that television was his ally. And he knew that, of course, partly from the experience with Nixon in the debate during uh, 1960. And people who heard that debate on radio thought that Nixon had won, and those who watched it on television were convinced that uh, Kennedy had bested Nixon. He understood what was happening in the world of uh, television, and there was just no question that imagery was big, big, big. After he was nominated, I was up on the Cape, and we wanted some special pictures of him around the Cape, relaxing. And I, I said, just when you come off the boat, well, I just come up. And he said, no, no, I'm, I'll not do that. I'll get a coat. He said, I think people want a dignified president. He just, he thought it through. He just kind of knew uh, how he looked best. And he, and he wanted that. And that, that's, that's a huge thing in today's world. It seemed JFK and Jackie knew that if you look wealthy and healthy, then people believe that you are. And believability is a politician's greatest asset. Much of the public embraced the Kennedy image as a perfect example of the American dream come true. You are going to create an image of a president who is a wonderful family man. The children, Caroline and John John, were a tremendous political asset, so to speak, Jacqueline Kennedy was an extraordinary political asset because she was so beautiful, so aristocratic, and gave Americans the feel that they had an aristocrat in the White House. That this was someone who could rival British royalty, who could rival the British aristocracy, and we liked that. So it was a conscious effort on the part of Kennedy and the White House to promote an image of the family man, of the loving father, loving husband, and behind the scenes, of course, there was a very different picture. Capturing the Kennedy appeal on film coincided with a radical change in photographic technology. Lighter and smaller cameras with interchangeable lenses and high-speed film allowed photographers to capture off-the-record moments quickly. These unposed, natural-looking snapshots perfectly reflected the Kennedy's casually elegant style. Photographs were coming into play in the 60s more so than in pre previous years as far as uh, the White House is concerned. We don't see many pictures of Eisenhower uh, or Truman or Hoover or Coolidge, you know, the, the old-timers. It, we never had a photographer following them around for any number of reasons. One, the art hadn't progressed that far yet. And the Kennedys became enamored of 35 millimeter photography. Uh, I, politics uh, uh, really hadn't gotten into it yet. The Kennedys were the first political family with real media savvy. JFK was born into a political dynasty an immigrant family that reached the highest office within three generations. The rapid ascent of the Kennedys was masterminded by JFK's father, Joseph Kennedy, a shrewd businessman, ambassador, and Hollywood producer. Joe Kennedy was a master of the art of uh, public relations. 
He had a family with nine children, and in the midst of the Depression, he gave the country the feeling that he was a, a family that could ride through this terrible economic crisis. And so he projected an image. He used his family. And John and Robert and Ted Kennedy, they all learned it from him. They learned that in this mass media culture of Oz, if you're going to be a, a huge success, you need to master the art of public relations, of how you deal with uh, a mass audience. And they were very sensitive to that. In addition to the cameramen that were assigned to the White House, the Kennedys themselves hired photographers to record their activities and travel with them wherever they went. Was the idea to create an archive of images for a presidential library or a collection of photographs to promote the Kennedy appeal to the public? Many photographers worked with the Kennedy administration. Two of the most prominent were Cecil Stoughton, the official White House photographer, and Jacques Lowe, JFK's personal photographer. There was a moment when the change occurred from him being an occasional person on the scene to someone who was part of the crew. He would go to Jack Kennedy and say, OK, Jack, what is it that you want me to capture? You know, what, what are you wanting people to see? You know, give me some direction. And Jack would just say, it's OK, Jack, just, just hang around, just hang out, just, just, just be here and just take photographs of whatever you want. This is a super wide Hasselblad. I can use this in my right hand and cover the whole inside of, a, of any given room. In the parlance of the trade, uh, a Hail Mary is when you uh, raise your hands up above your head with the camera and, and just point discriminately at the subject that you're trying to photograph without looking through the viewfinder. Cecil and Jacques captured the excitement and vitality of all White House events in stunning photojournalistic images. Jackie Kennedy knew that the White House itself was a great opportunity to show the world that the Kennedys were immensely proud of their American heritage. Back then, the world needed the Kennedys' sophistication and glamour. It had been such a down period for so long. We had World War II, and then we had problems with the communists and Europe. And along came President and Mrs. Kennedy, young, attractive, with two adorable children. Youth came to the White House. It wasn't stuffy anymore. Jackie looked as beautiful horseback riding in jodhpurs as she did in a Givenchy gown. Here was a first family that America could relate to and look up to. Whether serving gourmet French cuisine for the first time in the White House or sleigh riding on the South Lawn. There was a revolution in, in entertaining and the American public just ate it up and copied her in every way they could. Never before had a presidential couple awed the world as much with their entertaining as with their political message. The Kennedys helped change the perception of America. We had lots of visitors. Of course, the ones who were particularly glamorous were the ones that got the most attention. And when the Shah of Iran decided to make a, pay a visit on the Kennedys, Jacqueline's ears perked up because she knew that the Empress of Iran was a clothes horse. Everybody started saying, hey, you've got to show her up. You're our royalty. You've got to look better than the Empress. And in came the Empress, looking like an entire jewelry store. And there was Jackie in a little pink and white, simple little dress with hardly anything sparkling on her. And she looked so much better. One of the most successful public relations events staged by the Kennedys was a televised tour of the White House with the First Lady. By bringing her home into the homes of millions of Americans, Jackie's appeal skyrocketed. This state dining room symbolizes your 
duties as an official hostess. Do you serve many meals here? Yes, this is where all the steak dinners and lunches are given. By fortune of the era, by lucky accident, the Kennedys were the first who were able to really manipulate the television for their use. Uh, Jacqueline Kennedy's famous tour of the White House for CBS was unheard of. So it made America proud of the White House, and everybody had to see it. The public couldn't get enough. Fortunately, their hunger for behind-the-scenes viewing of their beloved first family was fed by a steady stream of images that photographers capture daily for newspapers, magazines, and tabloids. The president was advised by his aide, my boss, that there was going to be a lot of requirements in, the, in his future for pictures behind the scenes, if you will, private things. And it would be to his advantage to have someone that they could control to the extent that if I did something that I shouldn't have done, why, I'd be in Guam tomorrow. In order to make a great picture, you have to understand what a great picture is. Having been a magazine photographer herself, an inquiring camera girl for the Washington Times Herald, Jackie Kennedy understood photography as a real art form. She would have recognized that pictures of a loving father and family man send a powerful message to the public that the president is trustworthy and compassionate. After all, a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, this, this was my father's favorite photograph of, of Jack Kennedy. I think he, he felt a real affinity with this photograph because it portrayed Jack Kennedy as, as being just a, just a normal human being who was struggling with not being able to achieve you know, what he was hoping to achieve in that moment. He was talking to a group of longshoremen in Coos Bay, Oregon, and he just felt that he wasn't getting his message across to them. Jack Kennedy wandered off and was really feeling quite dejected and felt really defeated. And, um, and my father just walked away and turned around and, and saw him staring into the water. And he really saw his vulnerability, the sense of aloneness. And I, I think this photograph really captured Jack Kennedy as just being, you know, a human being with many emotions. I frequently got requests from Mrs. Kennedy to, uh, in fact, I got a handwritten note here from her on occasions to do certain things, to make certain pictures. And uh, one day she asked me to come over in the evening and, uh, and watch her put the children to bed. Caroline was all dressed up in a, in a fancy dress. And uh, the president came by a little bit later on, sat down and played the drum with him for a little bit. The Kennedys' relationship with photographers and reporters extended beyond the professional. People like Cecil Stoughton, Jacques Lowe, and Ben Bradley were trusted with access to personal family moments like vacations and private dinners. JFK appeared to enjoy the presence of the media whenever he spent time with his family. I know that my father felt very strongly that the he was, he was not denied any access, you know, whatsoever. And, and it started really from day one, I think, when, you know, Jack Kennedy greeted him at the door in a towel and and, and, and that didn't change during that whole meeting, you know, sat in a towel the whole time and Jackie Kennedy's in the bathtub, you know, splashing about and running around in a bathrobe. Well, weekends at the, at the Cape were a, a rare experience. I had a great opportunity to do things that nobody else was, was doing one of which was uh, being with the president at his private quarters, his private home, and going out on the, uh, the president's yacht, the Honey Fitz. Uh, he would take guests with him, uh, Jackie and he, and, and the children in most cases. Ben and Tony Bradley were close personal friends of both the president and Mrs. Kennedy, and on frequent occasions they would have them over for dinner. And for some reason, I got a call one time at home, and Jack asked me to come in and, and make a picture of them, and it was just the four of them. It was a, uh, a, a nice private little party. 
they built a, a, a sort of a country place in, in the Virginia countryside. And um, it was a sort of a fall weekend. And uh, we had uh, Bloody Marys on the, on the veranda or porch. And um, the pony was, uh, you know, uh, screwing up the pictures and going in and nuzzling the president. It was a great scene and everybody roaring with laughter. And uh, this was just after Jackie and Caroline had been uh, riding horses down below uh, in a field below. Forty years later, these playful home movies amuse, delight, and even move us. Kennedy had an easy camaraderie with reporters, and he charmed many members of the media. Well, it's well known that the president had friends in the, in the uh, in the press corps, and more importantly, he was he fancied himself as a reporter himself because he had a he had a job for a while with international uh, news back in the early '40s, so he had a, you know camaraderie with them, and on many occasions would uh, treat them to an aside as, as reported to or uh, an anonymous source type of thing. I went over one morning to uh, interview him. He said, here, let's get out of here. Let's take a swim. And I, you know, I'm not used to uh, carrying my swimming suit when I go for an interview with the president. I said, I don't, I don't have a swim. Ah, he said, in this pool, you don't need one. So we went over to the pool, which was still open. And, uh, you know, who takes off his, <laughs> how do you disrobe? <laughs> <laughs> so, we're just like the old swimming hall out in Iowa. We just stripped down there. And it was the only nude underwater interview that I've ever had with a president or anybody else for that matter. I think he was pretty smart about uh, the media. But in a, in a very, what seems to me now, to be a kind of an amateurish way. JFK sparked the media's insatiable hunger for insider access to the life of a president. I can't believe that it's such a, uh, a secret uh, that uh, you like people who like you. President Kennedy set the stage for the media frenzies we witness today. And politicians like Richard Nixon and Bill Clinton would pay the price in years to come. Because people have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. It is time to stop the pursuit of personal destruction and the prying into private lives and get on with our national life. As the White House went from black and white to technicolor, so too did the country, with images of the civil rights movement, Castro's Cuba, and the Soviet space race broadcast on every channel. America was getting their first view of the incredible power of television as well as photography. Now the public saw and heard everything. Or did they? As much as the media helped the president, it also created intense pressure for an administration whose successes and failures were scrutinized daily. Television was very important in educating Americans about racial injustice. The sight of the Bull Connor's police dogs barking and yelping and his fire hoses trying to break up a nonviolent demonstration led by Martin Luther King produced great change. Without television, the public and the president would never have known how bad conditions were in the South for African Americans. JFK had to act. Kennedy faced conflict at home and abroad. 
the Soviets were a very real threat to American security. How Kennedy appeared to the rest of the world would be crucial to U.S. foreign relations. Well, it was a very scary time. People forget that now. There were four million people under arms in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. We had half that number. There could have been a nuclear confrontation. The Kennedys gave a kind of hope that this could be averted. Because how could a family as attractive as theirs think in terms of a blighted future, of a, of, of a cloud over the horizon? And the new frontier was all about promise. And the promise the Kennedys needed to deliver was a successful marketing of American democracy. But as Kennedy traveled the world, meeting influential leaders, he would have to back up great photo ops and TV clips with real political muscle. In June of 1961, the Kennedys flew to Paris to meet with French President Charles de Gaulle to show the European establishment a new kind of American president. Kennedy replaced Eisenhower's military-style gruffness with suave star power, to great effect. De Gaulle was very much down on the United States and very questioning of Kennedy. It promised to be a, really a kind of a tough exchange. And I remember when this young couple came out of the door of Air Force One, they looked so good and they acted so good. And, and you could see old de Gaulle begin to melt right then. Here was youth, promise, here was energy, here was eloquence. It was just that you, you were just proud to be an American at that moment. And I think that was reflected all over the country. After a runaway success in Paris, JFK and Jackie headed to Vienna for a meeting with Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev. At this critical summit, Kennedy would be judged on how he stood up to the Russian leader in the game of superpower versus superpower, democracy versus communism. Image was crucial. Kennedy understood that the television cameras now, at least tapes of what you were doing, were following you everywhere. When he meets with uh, Khrushchev, in Vienna, and it gives the public reassurance that he's so much taller than Khrushchev. He's so much younger, seems so much more vital, and Khrushchev seems like, you know, a, a, a Russian peasant who uh, represents the past, and Kennedy represents the future. Kennedy suffered a disastrous blow at the Bay of Pigs in Cuba in April 1961. The U.S. supported effort to overthrow Castro failed, and Kennedy was blamed. In politics, bad press can only be counteracted by great press. So the administration planned whirlwind diplomatic trips, which generated fantastic photos and copy. And therefore, as a free man, I take pride in the word, Ich bin ein Violiner. While at home, images of the children charmed and comforted the country. Of course the press wanted to, to use the Kennedy children, particularly whenever there was trouble afoot. When there was trouble in America, when there were strikes or tragedies, you know, pop some pic pictures of the Kennedy children in the paper and people will feel suddenly better. And that happened occasionally. That was orchestrated, but only occasionally. Tension between the President and the First Lady soared regarding pictures of the children. JFK and his advisors knew how powerful the joyful shots could be in making America feel better in the face of mounting fear and anxiety. But Mrs. Kennedy, a notoriously private woman, wanted to protect her children. 
The press, of course, were hungry for pictures of the children, but there was never this behind-the-scenes, uh, close-up, uh, day-in-the-life-of type thing for the children, as far as Mrs. Kennedy was concerned. Why then would she allow photographers to document her private life, in personal quarters in the White House and on vacation? The president, on the other hand, realized that uh, those children made headlines whenever the press had a chance to use them. You know, what would often happen is Jackie Kennedy would, you know, would leave. Jack Kennedy would ring my father and say, Jacques, come on down, you know, I'd like you to take some photographs. And so he'd turn up and, and he'd say, oh, could you take some pictures of the kids? And Dad would say, you know, Mr. President, you know, I can't do that. Jackie doesn't want me to take photographs of the kids. And he'd say, don't, don't worry, Jacques, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll take care of it, don't worry. And he'd say, okay, so he takes photographs of the kids and... They would turn up in a magazine weeks later and he'd get a, you know, very irate Jackie Kennedy on the other end of the phone saying, you know, I told you not to take photographs, how could you? And he'd say, well, you know, Jackie, I spoke to your husband and he said it was okay. And she'd say, well, let's go and talk to my husband and see what he says. And sure enough, Jack would sort of deny having ever had the initial conversation and he'd say, you know, Jacques, you know, how, how could you do this? I, you know, I didn't give you permission. And, and, and so the relationship between my father and Jackie Kennedy suffered as a result, and I think she never really trusted him. There were photo ops, yes, upon occasion, but they were seldom. Most of the time it was catch a glimpse of them getting into their car to go to the circus. Natural things not posed in front of the press. There was very little posing. Today, everything is posed. We've seen the photos of Caroline and John John dancing in the Oval Office, playing on the South Lawn. We imagine the White House is a warm, inviting place. So what do these pictures of politics and play dates say about the Kennedy administration? This was real. Uh, my being there was incidental. He didn't call me in to, to say, stand here and do this when I make this face. It happened that way. But the, the fact that the president used photography in his, in his position, I would say uh, he was a master at it. He was offered the job of White House photographer and he happily turned it down because he knew that what that would mean for him was, you know, restriction all the way. And he couldn't function like that, my father. It wasn't how he operated as a photographer. And, and, and Jack Kennedy knew that about him and was happy to, to embrace him and to sort of welcome him onto the bandwagon, so to speak. And my father was never, ever given, you know, um, restrictions in terms of what he could photograph. Never. In fact, the very famous photograph of Jack Kennedy leaning on the desk, where you know he's leaning because he's trying to take pressure off from his back, is, is one of the key images that was sh shown in all the books. Not a problem. Forty years after his death, we remain transfixed by the photos of John F. Kennedy dashing, handsome, witty, and intelligent, a hero and a star. Yet despite controversial revelations about President Kennedy's private life, he remains a beloved American icon. It's well known now that John Kennedy was a, uh, a womanizer, uh, that he was a uh, tremendous philanderer. And I talked to journalists and asked them, did you know about his womanizing? Many of them said yes. Those who said they weren't sure had strong suspicions. But I asked all of them, why didn't you go after this? Given the current climate in which newspapers, journalists, uh, television folks wouldn't think for two seconds about uh, turning this into a uh, major headline story, uh, why didn't you go after it? And they said the culture of the 60s was entirely different. You did not probe a president's private life in that way. Kennedy was not the first president to have extramarital affairs, or the last. Was it a conservative 60s sensibility that protected the president? 
Or was it his charisma and cooperation with the press that caused them to willfully focus on other stories? He said, well, why didn't you do the women? Well, we didn't do it, basically. That, that's the first reason. But there was a crisis every week in that first year. We had the Bay of Pigs. Then the Russians beat us into space. Then Kennedy went to Vienna. Then the Berlin barrier. And all that summer, there were threats all over. Then we had the beginning of the problems in Laos. There were just uh, one thing after another. Well, that kept us busy. But every presidential administration has non-stop issues or events that can keep reporters occupied. The Kennedys were ahead of their time in influencing the images the media captured. There is no question but there was a spin on the president's health. He was a lot sicker than he appeared to be. He would just go limp after some of his appearances when he was very up for the television crews and so forth. Now that is, now you know you may criticize that as not telling the truth about the president's health, but of course the same thing had happened with Woodrow Wilson, with Franklin D. Roosevelt. They didn't want the public to know that these, these harmful things were happening to the president. The assault on his character over the womanizing needs to be balanced now by a consideration of what strong character he demonstrated in dealing with his ailments. JFK suffered from health problems since he was a young boy. Bouts with colitis hospitalized him for months at a time. Steroids prescribed for his numerous digestive disorders only weakened his spine and created progressive back problems. More than once, Kennedy's health issues were life-threatening. But this was kept a secret. In the early days, when I went into his Senate chamber, there were a pair of crutches. I see him on crutches in his office back then. And he, yeah, he looked kind of wan and, and uh, looked kind of run down. I think he was tired because he traveled a lot. But basically, he was, he was very photogenic. And also, they controlled the access pretty good. President Kennedy had to be even more image conscious. One of his greatest assets was his youth. Youth is equated with strength, and strength is equated with power. Ultimately, he controlled his image well enough to appear healthy and robust to the American people. But I remember going in one time in the Senate office and he was getting a haircut. And he was as vain as a woman. Don't, don't cut that. Oh, that's too much. No, no, don't do that. Do this. Just a little here. You know, it was painful to listen to him because, because he was very much aware that, you know, his hair, his teeth, his grin, all that were big. And I remember once I got out the Kerala and here was this very beautiful young flight attendant and she had her fingers in his hair and was massaging him. And I thought, oh, my goodness. I've, uh, I've stumbled into something very intimate here. I shouldn't be here. Well, it turned out that she applied what is called Mrs. French's hair preservative. <laughs> Quite medicine if I'd ever heard it. But he had the idea that he kept his hair. And he was very concerned about that. So he was very vain. The image of him is so robust and healthy and vigorous and playing touch football and out there sailing uh, uh, off of Cape Cod. Uh, this is the image of him, which they cultivated because what they did was to practice a cover-up. There was a cover-up of the extent to which he had these terrible ailments. If it weren't for the medicines, I don't think he could have functioned all that effectively as president. The Kennedy presentation of Vigor was a smashing success. The pictures we see today may not tell the whole truth, but the stories they do tell, stories of a handsome man commanding a yacht, or a youthful father playing with his children, are the stories and images people want to remember. I guess perhaps because we were so swept along by his vitality and, uh, and the newness of his politics that probably we didn't pay enough attention to his illness 
maybe we should have uh, dug deeper into that. And, and the circumstantial evidence about his girls was around us, and maybe we should have done something on that, but we didn't do that in those days. Uh, let's be honest about it, we probably violated the rules of, uh, of journalism and sat down in the classroom. We liked the guy. Just plainly and simply, we liked the guy. He liked us. He used to read all the stuff you did. So we journalists uh, kind of took him into our, <laughs> our group, uh, perhaps too much. Today's cat and mouse game between the press and the presidency seems unimaginable when we hear of JFK's camaraderie with reporters. What has changed? You know, when I first began covering the White House, first went there when I was with Life magazine, and, you know, there'd be a dozen of us and at a daily briefing, if we're lucky, maybe 20 if the news was big. Today, as you know, there are 50 uh, or 100, or on a big day, th two, three hundred. You've got the cameras up all the time. It's a 24-hour cycle. And, and, and television demands a mini-drama every night on the news. It's a hard uh, call to judge which came first, the defensive nature of the candidate, the isolation of the president, that sort of thing, or just this clamoring horde of news people that would n never let up. I think it's the, the sins are on both sides. We interrupt this program to bring you a special bulletin from Dallas, Texas. Three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade today. What was it, four days of continuous television? We'd never seen this. You know, the young prince is slaughtered on the streets of Texas. And, and for four days, that's the only thing anybody thinks about or hears. I was in shock for four days. I'm sure a lot of people were. But I, I, I just moved uh, like an automaton. My uh, trusty cameras worked for me. Captured on film, the horrific assassination of a wildly popular president, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. The news dominated the international press and the whole world experienced his death. Up close and personal. And it was terrifying. First off, a friend's killed. A friend, and I think America felt that. This was kind of their son or their brother. Uh, a friend is killed. Then, then secondly, a president, the head of our government, uh, the, he's cut off. He's dead. It's over with. And then, and then thirdly, an administration, the new frontier, is gone, because that's a very personal thing. The the tone uh, and the style of any administration comes from the president, and that was done instantly. So you have this huge, huge trauma, this convulsion, this upheaval. And the country's never forgotten it. November 22nd, 1963, would become a historical milestone in the American conscience. Anyone who lived through that fateful day can recall with lucidity where they were and what they were doing. For many Americans, Kennedy's death marked a turning point, a loss of idealism that would never be regained. Rising to power in front of the camera and dying in front of the camera made John F. Kennedy immortal. So much came together, as I say, a young man out of the war. Uh, America begins to really run the world at that time. He's good looking, the family, all of that sort of thing. And then you had a photographer who was in there that did it. But don't, don't discount what the assassination did. I mean, I, you know, that just engraved it on everybody's mind. Uh, we'd never been through anything, and that's part of imagery also. 
It's been uh, happening since he died. I mean, the interest in Kennedy is still amazing. And uh, the, the television plays a huge role in that, too, because uh, there isn't and the night goes by that you don't see Kennedy on television. If you want to, uh, somebody's running something about him. Now the photographs speak for themselves. However they were constructed, or what the motives were behind their making, pictures of the Kennedys continue to captivate the world. I suppose Jacques Lowe's pictures, he was the inside photographer for all those years. I suppose uh, he did 70 or 80 percent of the famous images of Kennedy that were so much a part of the campaign. And that's lived, that's stayed, and it's reproduced all the time, you know. We, every every few, few months there's another book on the Kennedys, it's, it's just inexhaustible. When he died, his, most of his, his appeal was promise. He hadn't delivered all that much in terms of changing the country, except in that sense of, uh, of uh, excitement and hope. But, uh, you know, that's all on the come, all to be, and uh, he never got there. Kennedy will continue to have this exceptional hold on the public because he's associated with young promise. And his brother, Bobby Kennedy, adds to this by dint of the fact that he was also assassinated at so early an age. And so all of them, Bobby, and Jack, and John Jr., having lost their lives at so early an age, so full of potential, so full of promise, and the country kind of clings to that promise. It's, it associates them with, with a better America. In the end, the Kennedy images are treasures. Snapshots and snippets of film make us eyewitnesses to a time when the world seemed more innocent and the White House was likened to the legend of Camelot. People nowadays especially describe the Kennedy family as, you know, you, you, in a sanctum you can't kind of get in there and get a sense of them and they're this tight little clan that's completely out of reach and when you see these photographs you feel you know you feel that you're there really you have a sense of being in the room with them Kennedy continues to have this exceptional hold on the public there was a poll asking people who is the greatest president in American history and Abraham Lincoln came in number one John Kennedy was ranked number two and on the face of it it seems almost absurd. After all, he was there for only a thousand days, and so the question remains, why this phenomenal approval on the public's part? I think the answer has a lot to do with television, with the fact that he is captured on television tape, so young, so vital, so charismatic, witty, charming, intelligent. And on that basis, on our commitment to build a strong country in a free world, I come to New York City on the steps of this old city hall. Television gave him a special place in people's minds. Indeed, he's frozen in our minds at the age of 46. And it will be done before the end of this decade. And I am delighted that this university is playing a part in putting a man on the moon as part of a great national effort of the United States of America.